Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz, and welcome to Ageless Iron, the show about antique tractors and the people that keep these historic marvels alive. On this week's episode, we feature the rare and beautiful 1937 Graham Bradley Model 103.93. I traveled to Virginia to take a tour of the immaculate Keystone Tractor Works Museum. But first, let's check out our feature tractor of the week, the muscle-bound International Harvester Model 1206. It was the 1960s and America wasn't the muscle. From California to Detroit to Cape Canaveral. And just as every American car maker was trying to roll out muscle cars, tractor companies were all racing to pack more horsepower into an affordable and versatile package that could pull bigger implements. Among farm tractors in 1965, bragging rights for brawn belonged to the International Harvester 1206, a beefy six-cylinder beast that overpowered its predecessors and made the competition sweat as it helped usher in a new era in farm tractors. These are the muscle cars like the Camaros and Mustangs that we grew up with farming and the belching of the black smoke just wreaked power. It's kind of like a muscle tractor to farmers of that era and so just a wonderful tractor to have in your collection. But what really spawned the birth of the 1206? The competition, more specifically John Deere's new generation tractors. Prior to the new Deers hitting the market, International Harvester had introduced its new world of power models, the 560 and the 460, that boasted a new look and new six-cylinder engines. But International Harvester still lacked a high horsepower row crop tractor line. Farmall engineers had already been at work fashioning a larger engine platform based on the six-cylinder they had built for the new world of power tractors. Designers took that concept and put it on steroids. Beefed up in every way, the new 361 cubic inch six cylinder was debuted in 1963 with the introduction of the Model 806. This direct injected diesel turned out an impressive 94 PTO horsepower. With all the solid groundwork completed, the introduction of a more powerful farm wall in 1965 was almost seamless. Save for some driveline enhancements, the 1206 was an extension of the 806. With one exception, the 1206 was turbocharged. That's right, the turbocharger was no longer the exclusive domain for cars barreling down the freeway. Farmers and ranchers could now turbo terrorize the terrain across America. Well, the Farmall 1206 was the very first factory installed turbocharger, thus making it the very first 100 horsepower plus tractor to come out of the factory. Uh, the turbocharger, if you ever hear a 1206 run, has a special whine to it. They're just a great tractor. I think they show well, they clean up well, and it's just fantastic to be able to have one. It's 361 cubic inch, six cellar turbocharged diesel, cranked out 112, PTO horsepower at the Nebraska tractor test. This 1206 power plant not only burned rubber, but it literally peeled it off the rims during testing prior to 1965. So International Harvester went to Firestone and Goodyear to get them to design upgraded tires for this turbo monster. That collaboration resulted in the venerable 18.4 by 38 inch heavy-duty tire that not only kept the beads from busting on the 1206, but also proved to be a mainstay for many tractors for years to come. The feature-rich Ronnie 1206 was an instant hit with farmers. I know when they first come out as a young farmer at that time that, you know, I really lusted to have one of those. The 806s were the formal tractor that uh, Farmall had at that time, and so this was a very special tractor, and I just think a great showy tractor. The 1206 sold for only three model years before it was replaced by the model 1256 in 1968. Just short of 10,000 of these tractors were sold making the 1206 an unqualified hit 
for International Harvester. This created a nationwide red power storm and unmatched loyalty for generations to come. Today the 1206 and its offspring are coveted by collectors and tractor pullers alike. Well, for me, I think it's the prettiest tractor that was ever made. I just really like the graphics. I like the white. I like the red, the way they blend together. As you can see, I love red tractors, and this is my baby, the 1206. Are you looking for a 1206 or any other mid-1960s turbo muscle tractor? I hope the cost of buying one at auction won't put you in the red. We've seen folks paying $25,000 plus for a restored tractor like this one. The bidders are the guys and gals whose dad bought one or two of these for the farm and gave those kids their first taste of real muscle power. They're snapping these bad boys up. You know who you are. Coming up next, let's check out this week's Aegis Iron Mystery Tractor. So please stay tuned. And now, this week's Aegis Iron Mystery Tractor. We're at a tractor show in Minnesota. Got a green tractor. Is it a deer? No. Is it an Oliver? No. It's a CCIL, or better known as a Deutz. Came in from Germany. This is an air-cooled four-cylinder diesel engine, German technology. And Deutz tried to import these tractors in the United States and place them in the farm market as a means to cash in on the growing need for horsepower in the United States. But there's too many good tractors and they found the competition kind of tough. Deutz would later go on to buy Alice Chalmers, would change it to Deutz Alice and a means to try to get into the American market, but even that didn't work out too good for them. Regardless of that, the Deutz engine was probably considered one of the best air-cooled diesel engines ever made. After the break, I'm going to visit the Keystone Tractor Works in Colonial Heights, Virginia, so please stay tuned. What do you get when you combine a 90,000 square foot building and 160 plus tractors and some trucks and some cars? Well, you get Keystone Tractor Works by Colonial Heights, Virginia. Certainly one of the more diverse tractor museums I've ever been in is here at Keystone. With all the tractors and all the trucks in the Keystone Museum, it takes a full-bodied shop to keep not only preserve them, but also to keep them in operating condition. And the neat thing about this museum is you can see the actual restoration take place through windows adjoining the collection. Wow, here I am in the sea of green, and what I love about this collection is not only the way that you've organized it by brand, but also you have such rarities in the museum here. Well, we uh, do have all 28 of the two-cylinder John Deere's. We have uh, 18 or 20 LP John Deere's in our collection. But also you have these great symbolic tractors like the Waterloo Boy that, that's here. But it's not all tractors, is it? I noticed off here to the side, you've got a few trucks, don't you? Well, we're in the trucking business, and we're kind of partial to the old, uh, uh, the old 18 wheelers of yesteryear. Yes. Hey, can we take a look at those? You bet. You've got some great trucks in your collection here. Keith, describe what you have. We have a 1920 white up in the other room, up through the newest things, 86 conventional Peterbilt over here. Road tractors, fire trucks and some day cab trucks, smaller gasoline tankers, pickup trucks. We, we got somewhat of a variety, and uh, I guess you saw the Hill Brothers Diamond T delivery truck. So people are attracted to the museum with the tractors, and they go through the tractor collection, think they're about done, and then they discover this amazing room of trucks. 
that's got to give them a little bit of pleasure, isn't it? Sure, I think so. Uh, you know, the, most of the people that come in here are, are a lot of truck drivers that have roots back to the farm and farm tractors and so forth. So they're pretty pleasantly surprised when they come over and see that we do have the tools they learn to make a living with. It's not all tractors and trucks here at Keystone. You've got a great collection of like battery cell testers, oil cans. Dave Hart has a number of his tool collections right here. There's something in every corner of this museum. It's going to be a bumpy. Oh, hey, it's a double feature. So we're ending our tour really where it all began for you, Keith, with this 1950 John Deere M. This was your uncle's tractor. Well, this tractor belonged to my aunt. Uh, Actually, my uncle, and after he passed away, had been sitting out by her house for several years. When I'd go to visit, I'd ask about the tractor, and she just brushed me off as everybody asks about that tractor, you know. So she called me and said she's going to have an auction and, and sell them. I acquired it at the sale. Was this the thing that gave you ironitis, the, you know, that bug that bites you and says, boy, I think I'll have another tractor and another tractor? I kind of fell in love with it and uh, got more interested. Uh, picked up some tractors at different auctions and yard sales and this, that, and other. Thanks, Keith. Well, for more information about Keystone Tractor Works, how to get here, and Keith's phenomenal collection, you can go to KeystoneTractorWorks.com. Coming up next, let's check out what's in your barn. So please stay tuned. Hey, what's in your barn? This week's What's in Your Barn is a John Deere Model A owned by Bob Jones of Erie, South Dakota. The Model A was a vast improvement over its general purpose predecessor, showing off John Deere's innovation despite America's struggles with the Great Depression. Bob saved this great tractor from the scrapyard and restored it to its former glory, preserving a piece of American history and for that, we're gonna send him this self-dimming welding helmet from Lincoln Electric. Hey, let us know what's in your barn by sending your pictures and story. If we use them on the show, you will receive an Aegis Iron gift as well. Coming up next, we feature the Graham Bradley Model 103.93. So please stay tuned. It was the late 1930s. America was deep into the Great Depression. You couldn't legally buy alcohol because of prohibition. The Tommy Gun dished out gangster street justice, and Art Deco ruled the style of the decade. Our Aegis Iron feature tractor embodied all that was the late 1930s, especially the styling. The beautiful Graham Bradley model 503.93 like some other tractors of the day, the Graham Bradley was produced by a car company. The Graham Page Motor Company of Detroit was grappling with the effects of the Depression, just like every other business. The company launched their first agricultural venture with the introduction of the Graham Bradley tractor. But why would a car manufacturer get into the tractor business? Simple. The competition was doing it, and there was easy money to be made especially if you could order one from a Sears catalog. The corporate leadership hoped this new and well-designed tractor could pull their car manufacturing firm through their economic struggles. But Graham Page did not have a dealer organization for tractor sales and service. So they contracted with Sears, Roebuck & Company to market the tractor, the Graham Bradley, through their stores and catalog. However, as a special inducement to potential dealers, the Graham Page automobile was optionally available with the Graham Bradley tractor franchise and vice versa. This indicates the tractor was being sold beyond Sears as well. Sears may have just been a ready outlet to get things going for Graham Page. The company offered the tractor in two models that differed only by their front axles. Both tractors came with a six-cylinder gas, L-head engine built for them by Continental. Made it to the engine was a four-speed transmission that offered a blazing 20 miles an hour road speed. The side panels were easily removed to service the engine. 
and the gauges were grouped on the control panel along with a choke, throttle control, and slick electric switch. Elegant, and she should be. The company took the bullet nose and sleek styling from Graham Page Cars, created by famed auto designer Amos Northrup of Murray Body, and put it on the model 503. This streamlined beauty not only announced its presence with a striking front grille reminiscent of a fighter plane, but also punctuated this nose with the distinctive side curtains, reflecting its Art Deco design roots. This grille design was so popular that other well-known tractor manufacturers of this time kind of borrowed it. Hmm, you see any resemblances? Announced in 1937, the Graham Bradley looked to all to be a hit, and Graham Page executive Robert Graham was making plans to turn out 10,000 tractors annually. In 1937, the company manufactured over 240 Graham Bradley tractors, the last general purpose Graham Bradley tractors sold in 1940. The relationship between Graham Page and Sears went south and sales ceased altogether in 1941. The automaker lacked strong distribution in the farm market and let the tractor die. But the story of what many tractor collectors believe was the most beautiful piece of field machinery ever built is more than skin deep. Not only did the Graham Bradley carve furrows in the Midwest prairie, her fate also helped shape the Manhattan skyline. After the Graham boys sold off their interest in the tractor company, they took their money and bought a little island real estate, which eventually became Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. Not a bad investment. Now, if you want to make an investment in a Graham Bradley, you're going to need to hurry. These beautiful tractors are becoming more rare every day because loyal owners are holding fast and restorers are cannibalizing the remaining inventory for rebuilds. And don't forget to bring your wallet. Fully restored, a 1937 model 503.93 is worth between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Hey, wherever they are, the grand boys have got to be grinning. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on another episode of Ageless Iron. Yeah.